Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. I'm Mark Lamus. I'm the artistic director of the Westport Playhouse, and I want you to meet our distinguished guests, all family. Um, ladies first, Maureen Anderman, who's going to be playing the leading role in um, Pete Gurney's new play, which we're premiering here, Love and Money. Next to her, Mr. Gurney himself. On this side of the screen, John Tillinger, the director of all of our Acorn plays. <laughs> and Michael Jurgen, the set designer of um, Love and Marriage. Of Love and Money, and uh, both the shows I'm directing this year, uh, and Broken Glass, Arthur Miller's Broken Glass. Michael also did the set for The Dining Room here a couple seasons ago, and Of Mice and Men before that. So anyway, it's a, it's a night for family. Um, the family of subscribers, we're so grateful to you for being here with us. Um, and really, when I was thinking about this today, the season we've put together for the coming year is really all about family. In many ways, the subject of the plays are familial, and also a lot of the artists who are working on them uh, have been here before, have wanted to come back, and uh, I'm grateful they did. Our first uh, show is an adaptation of an eight, uh, 17th century comedy by Pierre Cornet called The Liar. The adaptation was done by the brilliant David Ives, who's responsible for Venus and Fur, and all in the timing. He's a dazzling writer, a living writer, and he turned this ancient comedy into something rich, crazy, and wonderful. And also kind of moving and um, indescribably delicious. It's not at all like the uh, work that the brilliant Richard Wilbur did on all of his Moliere translations, which I'm sure a lot of you know. We did Tartuffe a few seasons ago. This is wilder and crazier. And to begin the evening, um, you're going to see the director of our production of The Liar, Penny Metropolis, um, who is in Ashland, Oregon. She has spent 20 seasons at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I knew she would be perfect for this play because not only does she have one of the craziest senses of humor I've ever known, I've worked with her as an actress, uh, I've worked with her when, uh, when she started directing, and I felt she would be perfect for this production. So without further ado, here's Penny talking about The Liar. Hi, my name is Penny Metropolis. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. This is a very unusual way for me to communicate. I always feel much more comfortable with a live audience, but I hope that I can convey to you how much I'm looking forward to coming to Westport and how much I'm looking forward to directing The Liar. Uh, it just so happens that Mark Lamus and David Dreyfus are both very long time friends of mine. Mark and I go back uh, further probably than either one of us want to admit. <laughs> I was delighted when he called me and asked me to direct The Liar and asked me to read it. I was even more delighted after I read it. This has to be one of the funniest and brightest contemporary comedies I've read in a very long time. Um, it's, I say contemporary. Um, the original, of course, is by the French playwright Pierre Cornet from the 17th century. And his play was considered to be the one outstanding French comedy before Moliere. Now, Moliere was very young when he saw Cornet's work, but he acknowledged that the liar influenced most of his writing. David Ives calls his play a translaptation of Corneille's comedy because he tweaked the play. He not only translated it, but he pretty freely adapted it. Um, I think bringing it vibrantly from the 17th century into the 21st century. The Liar steers clear of a lot of the dark satire that happens with a lot of Moliere's comedies. Um, it instead is this sort of buoyant piece, very human piece, celebrating a magnificent liar whose name is Durant. And we fall in love with him in spite of ourselves, just the way that we might fall in love with Shakespeare's Falstaff. 
like um, a great actor or an improvisatory actor, Durant spins these tales and mesmerizes us. He's like a high wire act. We watch him and wonder how he's going to get from one end to the other doing all of these tricks and turns. And we may be horrified and we may be amazed and we may be thrilled. And in the end, we are completely delighted by his prowess. This, I think, is in no small part due to Ives' dazzling rhyming verse. Now, David Ives says that when he was offered this commission by Michael Kahn of the Shakespeare Theatre of D.C., that he had never read Corneille's play. But he said when he read it, he fell in love with the language and the wonderful set comic speeches, and that he felt like he wanted to honor that by writing this in verse. I think that you'll find that David Ives' verse is not only hilarious, but completely accessible. Um, he's also said it in the original 17th century, and our wonderful design team has honored that. Um, though we've taken our cue from Mr. Ives and given the 17th century setting and costumes a few fun twists and turns, um, just like the plot has many <laughs> twists and turns, and Every single character is a complete gem, um, very funny, very vibrant, and I think you can see that in the costume renderings. Um, we've also assembled a wonderful cast filled with very talented and very charming actors whom I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy watch dance through this play. Although full of comedy, David Ives says that this is one of those plays, much like The Importance of Being Earnest, that seems to be made out of nothing, yet end up being about so much. I think we're lucky to have a David Ives who helps us celebrate and laugh at our foibles and remind us that we're not that different and haven't changed all that much since Corneille's day. Durant the Liar says, all the worlds lie and all the men and women merely liars. <laughs> Before I close off, uh, I want to tell you about when I first came to Westport, which was last January. Um, it was very cold, uh, but I was taken into the, the beautiful jeweled playhouse that you have there. And I was so moved, not only by how, what a lovely space it is, but by the history that that building contains and holds. And I feel very honored to have a chance to work there. I'm so looking forward to beginning rehearsals, and I hope you too will look forward to The Liar. Thank you. This is the young, exciting cast. It's an amazing cast of actors. It was. I was at the auditions a few weeks ago and <coughs> a nervous wreck because I thought, oh dear, we're not going to be able to find people who can pull this off. It's so buoyant and so light, but so deft. And uh, she has achieved a cast of some of the most exciting young actors I've come across and one a little bit older actor, Brian Reddy, a wonderful character man. Um, the costumes uh, are fully period and pretty grand. and. Uh, Jessica's done a, a beautiful idea with them. And Kristen Robinson, um, this, is the, this is the sort of modern take on the Palais Royal. I think it's very handsome, and uh, it's going to look beautiful on this stage. Kristen designed, um, uh, uh, gosh, Nora. <laughs> I can't remember the brief. <laughs> I was going to say the dollhouse. Nora for us last year. She's going to be designing uh, not only the lyre, but also... Um, um, and a nightingale saying, which you're going to hear about in a few minutes. So that is The Liar. That's our opening production. Very, very exciting way to open the, sh open the season. Our third production of the season is this world premiere by Pete Gurney called Love and Money. And we are thrilled to be co-producing this with the wonderful Signature Theater off-Broadway in New York. Um, we just had a reading of the play there on Monday with Maureen playing the leading role, and um, learned a lot and also laughed a lot. It's a terrific play. I thought it would be best to just ask Pete and Maureen a bit to talk about um, <laughs> what, they're, what they're up to with love and money. Can you, Pete, give us some idea of where the play came from in your head? We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, first let me just say this, because Maureen and I were talking off stage, and I was saying, I don't know how many plays I've had done here, but this is a very unusual situation for a town outside of New York to have not only supported and then recreated through Paul and Joanne a whole new theater with great acoustics. I hope you agree. I hope you can hear me. And, and, and <laughs> <laughs> no jokes Swearing down there. <laughs> and the, uh, it, it's just very oh. unusual and we, it, it, for a town this size to have supported for so long and so professionally a theater of this magnitude and interest. So I, I'm, it's always a pleasure for me to be here. And then I think particularly today it's a pleasure because I, I, I think we are all beginning to realize the theater is the last place, artistic place, that a community can get together, where people can get together and respond communally to what's going on on stage. Yes, you can go to a, a, a symphony, and, but you don't respond in the same way. You tend to respond internally to it. The, you don't, you get, don't get up in the middle of the movement and clap. But here, this is the theater is the last way that a, a community can only be created on stage through the actors and in the audience with the audience, with you. It's, it's a major feeling, and I hope you all feel it, to say I'm a part of this whole enterprise. So uh, I always love coming back to Westport because it's been very good to me over the years. And I'm, all, all, and I'm very proud to have a play now done in this theater today when the theater is a much more precious endeavor. So I just with that profound introduction, <laughs> um, we'll try to, Maureen and I will tell you just a little about what you'll be seeing when we do Love and Money. It, it, I guess it starts really in August, am I right? Yeah. It starts in August. So Maureen? Well. <laughs> 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 All right. First I just want to say, in 1993, I was privileged to create a new character for Pete in, um, Later Life, which we did off-Broadway, and then we, it was one of the plays that was done here. Done here that yeah. I, my, and I did it with my husband, Frank Converse, and Carol Shelley. And uh, so for me, it's a great honor to be involved in, in this new play by our esteemed and beloved playwright. Um, it's, it's a complex play. It's, it's love and money, the central character, my character, Cornelia Cunningham, is a, a woman of indeterminate age, as Pete has said to me. <laughs> she wouldn't uh, have done it otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, you know, I mean, you know, men in their 40s play King Lear, so mm. come on, I can <laughs> move on a little bit. <laughs> but she finds herself at this juncture. She's going to let, let a very privileged, wonderful, full life as a wealthy wasp. And um, everyone in her immediate family, her children and her husband, are deceased. And she comes to this point of dispersing her, her gifts. And she decides to be philanthropic and give it away. And people don't want her to do that for obvious reasons. But she is in her right mind in doing this. And this is the conflict in the play. Her lawyer doesn't want her to do it. Um, her grandchildren, they don't care. But um, she may have a, an offspring of, of her deceased daughter that she didn't know about who comes to claim his right to her fortune. And this is her dilemma. What does she do with this? Uh, she's a woman of oh, so many colors. Uh, she's, she's emotional, she's funny, she's witty. She speaks um, 
she describes things beautifully and completely. She's a very eloquent woman, a witty woman. She loves badinage, she loves sparring with people and teasing people. Um, but at her heart is this desire to, as she says, expiate her crime, her crime of having too much money because she feels that money has done a lot of harm. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to tell you what happens, though. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come, come see. Well, I, I think that's very well said, Maureen. And uh, let me add just one thing to this. Uh, we ha uh, this play opens here, and then it moves to the Signature Theater. I don't really know whether any of you have been up there, but I really recommend it. It's on 42nd Street and 10th Avenue. And we, and, uh, and it's being directed by Mark. So, and the Signature Theater has a large number of interns who are working there for practically nothing, but doing a lot of the grunt work. And I thought it'd be nice if they learned how a, a play takes shape. So we had a reading of it last... Monday. Monday, Monday. yeah, last Monday. <coughs> Ma Maureen read it and several other actors. And we did it for the, and I told the interns who were invited to hear it, I said, now you're just getting, I've never even heard this play read. Mark and I have talked a lot, of, not a lot, but somewhat about it. <coughs> and uh, so it's as new to me in many ways it is as, as it is to you. And the reading went on, and it, when it was over, Maureen, I hasten to add, was terrific, but I thought it was terrible. I thought, I thought, I, I, I used, I've worked a lot with John Tillinger in the past, and when we didn't get a laugh, he'd always say, whoops, we missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt this was that way with that. But it, I've always done that with this play, as Mark, with my new plays, as Mark can testify, or, or John Tillinger. And I, it, all it did was fire me, because hearing it, performed in front of an audience, hearing where the laughs were and where they weren't, and, and I'm not just talking about laughs, where the feelings were and where they weren't. It, it energized me, as it has always in the past. I knew I had written a play, I knew that. I knew it had possibility. I knew I had a great leading lady. <laughs> but I knew I had a hell of a lot to do. And so that's what I'm doing now. I'm, sitting in front of the computer, eager to work, and realizing how much of all plays are not simply written, but rewritten and adjusted in order to make them work. And Westport is a play, place that I've turned to many times to do exactly the same thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Wonderful. You know, we um, Pete was our honoree at our, our annual gala last fall, and um, it was a very special night for us to be able to to honor a playwright who's given so much to this community and to all of us who work here. Um, our next play is actually the second play of the season. It'll be directed by our associate uh, artistic director, David Kennedy. It's a beautiful family drama comedy uh, called And a Nightingale Sang. I produced this play years ago in Hartford, Connecticut, at the Hartford stage. It was brought to me by a producer who said, and you've got to remember this is like early 80s, um, if anybody remembers the early 80s, I don't know. <laughs> um, it was the early 80s and a producer friend of mine called me up and he said, I've just come from Chicago and I've seen this little funny company in a storefront theater <laughs> with this weird name. They call themselves by a German novel. And uh, they've done this play, and it's charming, and I think you should do it in Hartford. And I said, this all sounds completely strange to me. I'm looking for a sure thing. I'm not looking for a storefront theater in Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago. I left Chicago because the theater was so terrible. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> that, that was quite a while ago. Um, anyway, they were called the Steppenwolf Company. And they were all these young actors playing wide ranges of age. 
And I went out to see them, and they were great. So we brought them in, and the play then moved to New York and played at Lincoln Center <coughs> after it played in Hartford, and it was a success in both places. Um, and when we were planning this season, I had thought about this play for Westport for since I'd been here, because I love it so much, and I also remember how audiences embraced it. And um, David Kennedy, our director from Canada, far away, is going to stare down at you like Zog. <laughs> That's David. We think David's actually in Bethel <laughs> and pretending to be in Alberta, Canada, but, but uh, at any rate, enough with the staff jokes. Um, here's David talking about And a Nightingale Sang. Good evening, everybody. I wish I could be there with you at the Playhouse tonight, but thankfully the uh, miracle of modern technology allows this virtual visit. I am here to tell you about C.P. Taylor's magnificent play, And a Nightingale Sang, a play I had never even heard of as recently as several years ago uh, until Mark introduced me to it, and I was instantly taken with it. Uh, it's this remarkably warm, funny, poignant story about life on the home front in England during the Second World War. It tells the story of the Stott family. They live in Newcastle on Tyne in the north of England. It opens in their kitchen on the Sunday in 1939 when Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain comes on the radio to announce that Britain is indeed at war with Germany and concludes almost six years later in May of 1945 in in the celebrations of VE Day, Victory in Europe. And in the intervening six years, rather than showcase the enormity of the war, which is really the backdrop of the play, what it does is show you a series of sort of small domesticated scenes about life within this family and how they deal with rationing, how they deal with air raids, how they deal with absent husbands, uh, and how they deal with the romance that blossoms in the life of their oldest daughter, Helen, when she meets Norman, a soldier on leave. Now, Helen's a very interesting character because at 30 years old, at the beginning of the play, she's pretty much resigned herself to life as an old maid. And so the events of the war and the events that uh, surround meeting Norman uh, completely change her life and cause her to blossom in a way that she never has before. Uh, so in some respects, one aspect of the play is kind of an ugly duckling story, someone who thinks that their life is really one thing, and then they discover the possibility for it to be another. Uh, and of course, that romance in the whole play, not only uh, is it set against the background of the war, but it's set against the background of, of the kind of flourishing of musical culture during the war. There's all these extraordinary songs by Vera Lynn, such as And a Nightingale Sang in Barclay Square, which uh, is where the play gets its title from, The White Cliffs of Dover, and others that, that are really sort of the soundtrack of this family's uh, lives. Uh, and also dominating the stage in any production of And a Nightingale Sang is a big upright piano on which the father, George, likes to bang out tunes uh, in his way uh, both as a means of sort of escaping the, the, the madness of his family and also as a means of sort of um, entertaining himself and, and those around him. There's a really kind of convivial spirit in this play. There's also a sense of beautifully observing life as it is actually lived. So moments of great warmth and humor will be juxtaposed against moments of real uh, poignancy so that you really get the full spectrum of human experience in this play. And that's what makes it so extraordinary. The tone, the feeling, the mood is constantly shifting. So one minute you might be laughing, the next you might be crying, but you're always going to be fully in the center of this family's experiences and living life, living these events with them as they live them. Uh, and having the same kind of extraordinary experience. So I, I do think it's a remarkable play, a remarkable evening in the theater, and I really look forward to getting uh, down to work on it and uh, sharing it with all of you this June. So thank you very much. That's what I wanted to say, and I'll now turn it back over to Mark. <laughs> and this is uh, a part of Kristen Robinson's set design for uh, the show. Absolutely gorgeous, uh, very, very sensitively done. She's a young designer from Yale. One of her teachers was the man sitting next to me. And uh, 
She was our Princess Grace Fellow a couple years ago, and uh, we, we, the Princess Grace Design Fellow gets a chance here to um, assist all five designers of all five productions and then work on a production of her own. So uh, it's a great opportunity for a young, gifted designer. And, uh, and she is certainly that, sure. thanks partially to Michael. Um, and now, here's John Tillinger to talk about <laughs> bedroom farce. That's John, that's his name. <laughs> what can you tell us? Well, I haven't read this play, so I can't <laughs> tell you too much about it. I just hope it's good and I hope you like it. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, have, I have read it. Um, uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the operative word is farce. It's, I don't know, some of you must have seen some of the plays I've done here. I think I've done four of uh, Alan's plays here. And they, are, um, they all have a gimmick, as it were. Uh, the one last year was there were three floors in the same house and all the shenanigans that go on, uh, go on uh, in that house and the th things that uh, change. In this one, we have uh, three bedrooms and uh, four couples and three bedrooms. And what I... Uh, there's absolutely <coughs> no nudity, I'm afraid. <laughs> we had a lot of nudity last year. Um, so... Uh, and it's the, what I like about Alan's plays is that he, he attacks all the foibles of uh, human behavior and gets you to laugh about them. And they have a truth about them in, in the sense that um, you wouldn't be laughing, at least I hope you're laughing when you see this play because otherwise I'm in deep trouble. <laughs> um, I've only seen some of this play once and the time I saw it, the person I was in with not a name drop was Eileen Atkins, and she started vomiting in the first act. <laughs> so I had to leave. Um, so I hope that doesn't happen to any of you. Um, Has um, that happened to a lot of your dates? <laughs> yeah, a lot of dates. It's yeah. me, I think. Yes. Anyway, um, the, 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 uh, as I said, it's three bedrooms and the shenanigans that go on, and these couples are intertwined. They're, they're uh, related, or they're involved, or they were involved. And, um, and what I like about it is that he, he gets to the truth of how people behave when their backs are against the wall, uh, when things are going out of control, and um, how they cope with it in a comedic way. There is a, a statement always about Alan Acorn's plays that he writes about middle-class people and uh, um, uh, that uh, people of color and uh, lower class people just simply don't appear. And that is certainly true, but I don't think it, it should matter that much. Um, I've t tried once or twice to, to uh, try and introduce other people into it, but it doesn't seem to work. It's, it's, uh, I've always tried to look for somebody who might, uh, who might change the, uh, shuffle the decks a bit. Um, I, I enjoy the challenge of it, and it is terribly challenging because, as you saw last year, um, the getting into one part of the house and the other, and the other one still going on, or for those of you who saw the, How the Other Half Loves, where there were two different <laughs> things going on at the same time in two different places. And um, I'm glad, and I hope that the cast sort of been assembled so far. Paxson Whitehead will be back. Um, C.C. Hart will be back. Uh, Sarah, oh God, <laughs> Sarah, yes, yes, well, Manson will be here, who was in, uh, uh, who was in uh, Things We Do For Love, and most especially, I think, Carson Elrod will be here. And hopefully, um, Geneva Carr, who did all of my acorns here. Uh, she's on Broadway at the moment, so I hope she has a huge hit, but it closes in time for her. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, what else can I say? I, 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 the plot is so complicated and so, uh, so extreme. Um, the play was a huge hit on Broadway, as far as I remember. Um, and uh, there were two or three wonderful actors in it who won Tonys. Um, and uh, I just hope that uh, we can do it right. What I'm always confident about is that if Paxton's in the play, then I'm going to be okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Well, and if you're directing an Akeborn play, it's generally wow. going to be okay. Yeah, oh, it's it I is. try. Oh, it's wonderful. I just thought the work you did on, um, <laughs> yeah, on, on last season's Things We Do for Love was simply impeccable, and the company was such a brilliant group of farceurs. I, for me, what always, um, what I love about Akeborn the most is that, you know, you, we do tend to laugh at people's painful moments, and, and somehow he has created such pain in them, and yet you still laugh. You know, it's extraordinary. I used to watch, I used to sneak into the theater and watch from up there um, certain scenes of that production because I loved the way it veered from tremendous pain to huge idiocy in seconds. And to watch those brilliant farceurs navigate that was, was a particular pleasure for me. You get, you get some perks when you're an artistic director, and that's one of them. You get to watch other people's work occasionally. The last play of the season... And Mark was wonderful. I just want to add this. Uh, we had no idea whether this was working or not. And he came in, and he started laughing, and I thought, it's going to be okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, the last play of the season is very special for us because it's a celebration of the centenary of the birth of our Roxbury neighbor, Arthur Miller. Uh, Broken Glass was one of Arthur's late plays. And um, Michael Jurgen is designing the production uh, with, and I'm directing it. No casting has yet been done because it's the end of the season. And um, it's, it's meaningful for me because I had uh, a number of associations with Arthur over the years Yes, the person who's not wearing glasses is me. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, I was planning a production of The Crucible, which actually never came about. But when um, this magazine, this theater magazine, heard about that, they asked me to go and interview Arthur at his farm in Roxbury. And I had already known him because as a very young actor, I appeared on Broadway in a terrible flop of his called the creation of the world and other business, which if you read it today is actually quite a wonderful comedy, but no one wanted to hear comedy from Arthur Miller. The thing people don't realize about Arthur is that when you were alone with Arthur or at a dinner party with Arthur, and I think all of us know this, he was as funny a borscht belt comedian as any, <laughs> just, he was, he would tell the most outrageous, terrible Jewish jokes. I mean, wonderful, absolutely howling with laughter, everybody around the table. And he also, his great seriousness as a writer was leavened by this fantastic sense of humor. Um, Broken Glass is, a, is, as I said, a late play. It's from 1994. Uh, it premiered at the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven. And in fact, our own Annie Keefe was then a stage manager at the Long Wharf, production stage manager, and was on that play. So the play is already very much a kind of in-house, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of part of the... DNA of all of us. And um, I worked with Arthur a few times over the years on other projects. Uh, I directed his second to last play, Resurrection Blues, at, at the Old Globe in San Diego. Worked with him again there because he was doing rewrites, etc. cetera. Um, so it's important to me to be able to share this play with you. Uh, it's very, very powerful, dense, and I think kind of liberating in a way. I don't want to say too much about it because it's constructed like a kind of thriller, like a mystery. A woman, it's about Jews in America basically dealing or trying not to deal with their Jewishness at the prelude to the Second World War as these things are going on in, in Germany that people in America basically at that point wanted to ignore. We were pulling out of the Depression. And um, the female protagonist of this play, uh, reading about Kristallnacht, suddenly is paralyzed. She can't move. And um, she's crippled. And her husband is a kind of self-hating Jew. He's trying to change his, he tries to change his name. He doesn't want people to think of him as Jewish. So it deals with these really important issues about identity, about history, about how uh, 
how we let the world affect us or reject those feelings and keep them at bay. Um, because it's at the end of the season, uh, working on it hasn't begun with Michael and me. So we thought it would be interesting for you, <laughs> maybe not, um, maybe not. <laughs> to, to, to sort of hear about a little bit about how we work together, because we've worked together so many times on so many productions that we kind of have a shorthand, a really shorthand. Um, and uh, I remember before, before Michael speaks, when we first started working together, it was a kind of forced marriage. I had to fire a designer. I was doing a production of As You Like It, and she just was not getting it, you know? And I had to let her go. And the costume designer who was on the production said, you should meet this guy I'm working with at Yale, Michael Jurgen. And I said, well, okay, I'm desperate. I'll meet anybody. Just, you know, <laughs> let's have a meeting. <laughs> and he came to my apartment, and he had a million ideas, one of which <laughs> I remember, involved live chickens on stage. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and I was looking at all these pictures. I thought, it, this is like working with Mozart. You know, <laughs> just the ideas just kept coming. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you... Came I mean, up with the chickens? <laughs> no, because we probably won't do chickens no, in this. Well, I thought... No, I just... <laughs> I mean, how do you enter a play? Do you get an immediate idea? I've never really I think asked... with Broken Glass, I think the title itself is so strong that it's hard to get away from that image. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I read the play and discovered that they, that they which Cristal Noct was one of the most horrific, I mean, anyone who's read about it or, or knows about it finds it one of the most horrific moments in history. And that this play is running, is sort of parallel to that moment. It's such a striking uh, uh, image in my mind. I have no idea how we're gonna connect it or, mm -hmm. or how it will materialize, but I somehow, some play, you know, I'm also doing the Keith play, and, and when I read that play, I mean, every item he describes, I can see it, I, I can almost smell it, I can taste it, because uh, I feel like I've been in that apartment, I know what that world is. With this one, it's like you don't feel that way about it, it's about a different kind of an idea, mm -hmm. and so it's gonna lead, I lead us into other, other territory. I yeah. Think. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's certainly research. It, this one's in Brooklyn, that one's in uh, the Upper East Side. So mm -hmm. you look at pictures, you, you feed yourself on all the kind of visual imagery that you can find, and then we get together and somehow it happens. It happens, <laughs> yeah. Very often, I think, uh, you know, the, the first conversation a director often has about a play where he's just been studying it on his own or whatever and talking about it with a few people, but maybe not, the really first discussion is with a designer. And I so rely on designers to guide me into the play very often because they'll always, the play is, is words, it's an oral experience, but the designer has something visual to talk about and show you. And instantly that just catapults you into another, into another place on, on the production. For me, um, and I don't know if it'll end up like this or not, but I think the only thing I mentioned to you was that mm -hmm. when I read it, I thought, gee, it, it maybe should look like a film noir. Um, <laughs> It's got this kind of atmosphere of suspense and hiding and, you know, these, these reverberations in Europe in this terrible time. Uh, and it's New York, it's Brooklyn, and I'm a big fan of film noir anyway, and I use yeah. a lot of, yeah, yeah we, totally. we've used a lot of images of film noir in our, our, our other work. Um, but that may not end up be, being, you know, in the production whatsoever. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting process. Michael, right now, is um, in previews for a little project called The King and I. <laughs> um, in, and has, I guess you have most of Siam on stage, uh, yes? A little bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's it, one of the, the things that's difficult about, about talking about uh, broken glass or anything else right now is that when you're involved, when you're in the theater with a the play, especially when it's in preview, it's like you really, just have blinders on and it's really hard to think about anything else. And so th I feel like I've just come from Siam to come up here to, <laughs> to talk to you because it's been, we, it, I'm inundated with it, yeah, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but in a way it's a, it's a wonderful relief. It's a, and, but, and it's almost like, uh, it's almost like what, what you were saying about hearing your play read for the first time. It's like suddenly we get it all up there and we've been working on it for so long. And you go, oh my God, this is just awful. This is, the painting is terrible. The, you know, you just go through all of this, and it, it's like moving into a house for the first time. You have to 
get used to where the furniture is. So when you wake up in the middle of the night and try to find the bathroom, you don't trip over the Siamese jug or something. You know? <laughs> it's like, it's that kind of thing. It so. is a, you know, we, <laughs> we go through a process called technical rehearsals, um, which I know some of you come and watch a bit. Um, and these are the rehearsals that take place three long days from noon to midnight and, and, and longer really, starting much earlier for a lot of the crew uh, and a lot of and the design staff, et cetera. These long, long, long days where you do sort of move into a production physically. You've been in a rehearsal hall, you've all been dressed like this, suddenly you're in 18, they're in 18th century costumes, they have wigs that are painful, they can't see because they can't wear their glasses, they're, <laughs> you realize the tree is in the wrong place even though you've blocked the whole play around the tree, we've got to move the tree 10 feet. All of a sudden, everything changes, and it's an extraordinary way to make, <laughs> you know, to, to go through your life to be always having to kind of readjust the, the picture. But yeah. as Michael said, you kind of move into the play. I always, so many times you've come to the first tech, no matter how busy we've all been or whatever, right. and you'll say, oh, I'm so glad to be here. I just finished doing <laughs> that. I'm, right. Now it's I true. can focus on this, because there's a kind of energy in this room, you can't imagine when everybody sitting here is just working on what's on this stage to find the vision, to find how the play wants to breathe, what it's saying to us. A lot of time in a tech rehearsal, you just watch and listen. I always say, you know, let's not expect this to be what we had in the rehearsal hall. We're in a different space entirely. The lights are dark, the lights are on stage. We're adjusting all of that. Let's watch baby start to take its first steps, mm. see where it's gonna go, you know, and release ourselves from having it have to be what we thought it was, because it'll always start to blossom in another way, depending on how you kind of water it and how you look at also, it. Also, there is, p other people have talked about it, but I really believe that there's something magical about this room and about this space, about the relationship to the yeah, audience. Terrific. That's incredibly, Comfortable. You feel mm. like you when you come back to Westport, you feel like, oh, I can take my shoes off and I can just relax and we're gonna have a great time and we'll learn new things and there's just a warmth about it that yeah, uh, I agree. that I always feel. So you feel like they're good ghosts that they're on mm -hmm. your side and they're, yeah. they're kind of shoring you up and and I think that's why people love to come here. The campus is beautiful around here. It's like you go outside and take a deep breath of fresh polluted air <laughs> and, and uh, you know, but it's just there's something I love about it and. So I'm always delighted to, to come back here and to work we're, with you. We're delighted to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And we're delighted. <laughs> we're really delighted to have you. We, we begin this process by sharing all of this stuff with each other. But the ultimate sharing is to send it out to you and to have it be, as Pete said, this kind of visceral conversation that happens. It's getting rarer and rarer as we look into our electronic devices. Um, getting rarer and rarer as we kind of close ourselves off to have a communal experience that's a kind of contact sport with living, breathing actors in front of you, creating something for you to respond to, to climb into, to think about, to laugh at. So I hope you'll enjoy this season. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you.